Hello, my name is Marilyn Madigan. I'm the national president of the Ladies Ancient Heart of Vibranians. One of our things that the Ladies Ancient Heart of Vibranians does is our motto is Christian charity. And we have a primary mission of the Columban fathers and sisters, but we do not end there. We are concerned with all Catholic ministries and also non-denomination ministries that serves the needs of our community. I have been fortunate that as a child, I grew up next to a, a strong Irish Catholic family. Their oldest child, Kevin, became a priest in the Diocese of Cleveland. And his work has led him from Cleveland to Cambodia. And at this time, I'd like to introduce you to Father Kevin. Father Kevin, as I said, it was a priest of the Diocese of Cleveland. He has recently served as a Marinol Associate Priest in Cambodia. He has a devotion to St. Dimphna. And Kevin, can you explain to us why St. Dimphna is so important in your life? Thank you, Marilyn. Um, St. Dimphna is the uh, Irish saint, the patron saint of the mentally ill. And when I went to her shrine, uh, the National Shrine of St. Dimphna down in, in uh, Massillon, you see her image there. And I don't have a photo here, but you see, underneath her there is these chains you know and somehow what she did 1300 years ago was give dignity to people who were mentally ill a model that's still being used today uh so many hundreds of years later dimphna is a wonderful model and i am offering this mental health program at this time to her to her intercession and her help thank you kevin I know St. Diphna has a very important role in our Irish Catholic upbringing, and we do have some divisions that have named themselves because of Sister uh, St. Diphna. Now, you've been in Cambodia for 16 years. Can you explain to us how you were assigned to Cambodia? Uh, yes, actually, the weekend before I went to Marinol as an associate priest, I went to the University of Notre Dame. And I happened to run into the head of Marinol, and he said to me, um, Kevin, I want, I was under the Golden Dome, and I said, Kevin, I want you to think about going to Cambodia. And I walked out of the Golden Dome and walked over to the grotto that many people know is very famous. And I looked down, and there was a plaque from Dr. Tom Dooley to Father Hesburgh. And Father, or, or Dr. Dooley was, Tom Dooley was in Laos. I looked at the plaque and I said, Laos, Cambodia, close enough, I'm going to Cambodia. That was the end of my um, discernment, so to speak. It was a sign for me. <laughs> so anyways, that's how I got there. And I've been there now for 17 years, actually, Marilyn. So, yeah. And Kevin, the other day you were talking about a story with Our Lady of the Macon. Would you mind sharing that? Uh, yes, one of the uh, joys uh, actually, is I get to celebrate Mass up and down the, the Mekong River. And one of the villages that I went to happened to uh, have this experience where there was a big statue of Mary that showed up that came from the middle of the Mekong, okay? And she was underneath the water. And the story goes that she was, um, th there were these uh, Buddhist uh, fishermen that pulled the statue out of the Mekong. And it's about a six foot tall statue, you know? And, and then they took it to the, uh, the Muslims. They want they were looking for some money. And the Muslims said, it's not ours. And then they brought it to the Catholic community there. And the Catholics said, yes, it's ours, but we don't have any money. Well, they went home that night and they had like a bad dream or some kind, okay? They came back the next day to the Catholics and they said, Here's your statue of Mary, you know, and uh, and so um, the, the, as it turned out that the our Catholic community, uh, the Vietnamese Catholics there, did give them some rice and things like that. But then here we have one of the uh, uh, this beautiful statue from I, we don't know where it was made, maybe in Italy or something that was in, in the Mekong. And you say, how did it even get in the Mekong, you know? But uh, if we know the history of Cambodia when all the churches were destroyed and uh, 
the cathedral was destroyed and during the killing fields of Khmer Rouge time in 1975 to 79, uh, I think they were sending Mary to the bottom of the Mekong for her protection in a way, you know, the community as the, um, you know, as, as the, uh, to, I don't know. But anyways, I, who knows the truth behind this, how she even got there. Uh, but right now she's a place where people go to pray and to, uh, and to really do pilgrimage. So, well, Kevin, when you were telling more and I me the, the story the other day, I can't help but think that Our Lady of the Mekon is guiding you in the work that you're doing. I know that uh, you have done a lot and you've trained other members of the Cambodia population to help you. And I know we have on this call uh, Hung. And if you and Hong could please tell us a little bit more about the actual ministry that you guys do. Hong, would you like to start about that? Uh, sure. Um, hi, Marilyn. Hi, um, everybody. Uh, my name is Hong Chuan. Uh, I'm a Marino lay missioner. Um, I've been working in Cambodia since um, about nearly um, going on 10 years, I think, yeah. And um, my work is with the uh, missionaries of charity uh, of um, Mother Teresa of Calcutta. And uh, we are serving the uh, uh, people who are either developmentally, uh, living with developmentally or physically, um, you know, challenge. Uh, so they are, um, uh, sometimes have been abandoned or sometimes have no one to look after them. Uh, so the, the home of hope is where I'm working with the missionaries of uh, charities. It's like a, like a refuge, um, you know, for them to, uh, to have home, to have uh, companionship um, and also to have cares and shelter, um, medical, you know, attention uh, whenever they have problems uh, so that has been uh, they, they like such inspiration to me you know mm -hmm. um, because they uh, they're so open and so warm and welcoming us you know who are uh, foreigners you know coming to them and uh, hope, hoping to offer a little bit of some uh, something that we could share you know, together in terms of hope and, and living in, uh, in hope, you know, to go through the difficulties of life. So uh, that has been my ministry, yeah. Marilyn, thank you very much for uh, that, yeah. Hong. Thanks, thank Kevin. Marilyn, uh, just so you know how this interfaces, our mental health work is in the communities in many uh, provinces throughout uh, Cambodia. And so we um, uh, actually, between the brothers and the sisters, the uh, Missionary Charity Sisters, we've sent many people who have mental illness to them uh, to, to, uh, uh, to, to give them support that they need. And, and, and again, the first person that I sent uh, to the Missionary of Charities was a woman who was about 40 years old. She had been in a cage for about three years. And she was, when I first met her, she was half naked. And she, um, uh, you know, finally, when she was able to go to, with the sisters, she had a sense of um, dignity and she's still living there today. But she was my first patient and she was, uh, in a cage for three years. So, um, yeah, so that's, that was the best way that the people could treat her. I mean, her mother and her mother didn't have another alternative for her. So she was actually under the house and it was terrible, but now she's doing much better. So. Thank you, Kevin. And as we look at this screen, it is um, rendering of a television report on you. Um, that's correct. Yes. Uh huh. So I'm just gonna show a, just a little bit of it. Okay. No sound, huh? 
you know, this is where, how we go out into the villages, out to the countryside, Maryland. We're heading out there. <laughs> yeah, this is kind of every day. Our community, our team does this. And I'm in the this band at this time, and to the left of me is uh, uh, one of our trained psychologists, one of the few PhDs now we have. And um, this is everyday life for us, Marilyn, and the way we, when we go out to uh, meet the mentally ill. So, uh, and now that we're here at this screen here, since we just stopped that, Marilyn, that's great, good, you know, this is our most recent, let's say, patient that we have. If you look there, there's Father Charles from Kenya and my staff, uh, Chanton, on the left was a young man. And you might be able to see that he is, has a chain around his leg. And I, I don't know all the details necessarily, but he's been that for a long time. And on the right is what happened after three months of our care and and uh, medications and you see the difference of transformation in his life so and this happens many times with our people um, once we get the right kind of care for them now they have a long haul ahead many of them but uh, it's definitely uh, very different and you've made an impact on their lives can you tell us a little bit more about they're transforming of the lives that you've dealt with? Yeah, let me start with who the people are. Um, somebody wanted to remind me, said, uh, Father Kevin, you don't work with the poor, you work with the outcast of society, the people that are abandoned and thrown away people, you know? And he wants, he's another priest who says, and you tell the people that that's who you're giving dignity to. That young man and the others we serve, approximately 200 of them, would be not even living in their houses, okay? And so they would be outside the house, living on a, as you saw there, under a little roof. And that's how they stay for sometimes years at a time. And, and so our work is to, first of all, you know, talk to the, work with the community and work with their family. The families don't, they're not trying to do anything bad to their loved one. They don't have any alternatives. And what they've done is many times they've taken them to the, what they call the crew Kamai, the traditional healers. And maybe they get better a little bit, but then they go back and then they lose and then they spend all their money. And then there's no alternatives. There's no psychiatric treatment in the areas where we serve in, in Cambodia. And that, that man is about four, four hours outside the city. And it's very expensive for him to um, come impossible, impossible literally for their family to afford uh, any treatment in, in, the, in the city without our support. So um, for me, it's, uh, yeah, here's, let me share with these photos. Um, the one on the right is actually a man I met there on, uh, on Thanksgiving day, you know, and he, there were actually two people chained in his house, okay? And, and the, the reason for this, again, is for safety, for the family, for the community. And, and what we've tried to do with him is to get, even though you don't see his face or anything like that, is we try to, um, uh, we work with the police and all the other leaders in the community to help this person because everybody wants him to get better, but they don't know how to do it. I, I have a team that does know how to care for people like this now, and we've done, had much success um, with, um, how would I say, walking with them and, and, and educating the families and encouraging the caregivers, because these folks do have people that care for them in their families. You know, I mean, they have, we, we actually study them. We, we work with them, the caregivers too. So um, our programs probably helped 100 people have been chained. That's minimal, it's, as it says there. Uh, uh, I would say we have more than that. And we also have a whole group of people, let's say a hun another 100 who have not been chained, but they're inside government uh, facilities, you know, uh, 
the one place that ha has psychiatric care for the mentally ill, a government thing. And we go there and we, we uh, pr pr help the, them with and uh, facilitate their health too. And those people, when I met them the very first time, they didn't know their name. They, they were non-communicative, every one of them, you know, and fighting and everything. But now, because of our support and because of the, um, the better conditions, uh, life has improved for them. And, and hopefully someday we'll get them back with their families too. Um, but yeah, so these are a couple of the people that, we, uh, that we've helped uh, in. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, so this story is uh, pretty much as traditional what happens to most of our people. This is how people seek help in Cambodia. They're, they are normal uh, childhood, let's say, they have friends and things like that, but many times around the age of 20 or so, they have this psychiatric problem that begins, we'll call it schizophrenia with many of them. And so they took them to the traditional healers, seem to get better, but then the voices and erratic behavior comes back never took any drugs or drank alcohol, but the voices and loss of his friends got progressively worse until he had no friends. Um, the villagers pity them, pity our people, but they don't know how to help. And then they also are very frightened of our people too. That Chanton that my staff person we saw on the previous slide, she's amazing because she knows that, she knows how to help the people. And she's not afraid of uh, dealing with uh, people who are oftentimes much bigger than her. Thank so. you, Kevin. Mm -hmm. And you were mentioning I, the compassionate one, hearts of people. Uh, so. Look at Marilyn, this is so important. Our mental health program does have a compassionate heart and the desire to reach out to the poor. We can't do this with just training alone. We need more than training. You know, you need a heart that says, I will reach out. And, and we have an actual center that, we've, that we uh, work at. Uh, it's called the, uh, the Center for Compassion in a place called Chunkiri. And we share this with um, uh, some very uh, children, with children who have many difficulties. And so our people, our staff every day is reaching out to the poor. Um, so as it says, there's somebody said to me the other day, Father, our staff needs hearts of compassion to do this work because there are easier jobs with better pay. <laughs> I assure you, you know, uh, our staff does not make a lot of money. And the travel to the distant remote villages can be very challenging during this time of the year for five months. Cambodia is in a rainy season and it's, um, and, and we are really the only a possibility, you know, of, of our people getting better. Um, and that's it. We are the only possibility for our, you know, or they would, people would stay the way they are forever, really. So the patients we meet are oftentimes unable to communicate with our staff, but then little by little, uh, through the reach out, the, the compassion, uh, that happens in, in uh, so many, almost every day. It's wonderful to see, so, yeah. Kevin, you so, were saying that you were a Marriott associate. Mar Marinol, not Marriott. Marinol. Marriott's a, Mar Marriott's a Marinol <laughs> associate, but uh, that has changed, correct? That's right, uh, Marilyn. Uh, my contract, uh, when you're an associate priest, you work, you work under a contract. Uh, and between the Bishop of Cleveland, in my case, and, and, and Marinol. And I had three contracts of five years each. And uh, that contract ended uh, last year, actually. Um, so, um, so, but in the midst of it, I said, I've got this ministry uh, that I would like to keep going after the contract and the funding ended from Marinol. And uh, so I said, why not try it, you know? And again, I, I, I think that um, for me, this is 
not just a project that's a one, two or three year project when we talk about reaching out to the mentally ill, but I think like St. Dymphna, you know, I mean, who's for, you know, the spirit of her is long-term, you know, care for the poor, care for the mentally ill. And that's why we still think about her so many hundreds of years later, because she was concerned about a ministry that's, I think, at the heart of what the church should be doing. And, and that's just projects. So I see this as a ministry of the church, uh, even though it is a project for mental health. And it's both. So... And Kevin, as someone that's known you probably both both of our lives, um, yeah. I admire the work that you've done. I see a need. Um, mental illness is a problem here in the United States. It's also a problem everywhere around the world. I admire you for doing this work, and I would like to see you being able to continue. And I know you did say you, um, with Bill Todd, um, who was ambassador to Cambodia from the United States, who also wants to help. You formed a, a nonprofit. So if you could explain that little bit of that nonprofit to us. Right, okay. This is, um, you know, when the door closes, you gotta open up the window to get in, you know, and you find the way. And so when I realized that my contract with Mary Null was gonna end, I have this friendship with uh, Ambassador Todd, who you see there in those photos there. You see us in the bottom photo. I just talk about that. Um, that's at the US Embassy on the 4th of July. And uh, there I am kind of laughing my head off a little bit there, you know, and uh, wearing his suit, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, and uh, so we're, uh, you know, we're standing in front of the US Embassy in, in, in Phnom Penh. And uh, um, so our friendship, I think, has led us to try and, and develop this um, uh, project, uh, canaspromise.org. And um, let me explain the name a little bit. You know, the wedding feast of Cana. And it's um, it, it, Bill, it's the Bill's mother was a very, she died recently too. So it was like, like Bill's mother's death and my uh, ending of the contract with Mary Null, we decided let's do Cana's Promise. It was his name that he chose. And I said, okay, the wedding feast of Cana. And so we're trying to make the world a better place. Ambassador Todd is retired now from the State Department. You know, he was actually, he was the Under Secretary of State for, I think, Human Resources and, um, and a couple other things. And we said, let's try this. And he's had a great love for Cambodia, even though it's been several years since he's been the ambassador there. He's never forgot Cambodia, even though he's had posts in uh, Brunei and Afghanistan and other places. He um, really wants to help the poor of, of Cambodia. And hopefully Canis Promise will help us do that. Um, we are a 501c3 you know, recognized as a, as a charity in the United States, um, which hopefully will help us facilitate uh, our fundraising. Um, it's challenging starting a new thing, but you know, the, if we think of the wedding feast of Cana, you know, it's the first sign that Jesus did, uh, you know, is uh, he turned the water into wine. And, you know, and again, Mary was involved in that story too, you know, with Mary, said to those folks, uh, those servants there, do whatever he tells you to do. And uh, so they, that's, it was their obedience. They're listening to Mary and they, they follow Jesus. And so I think that our work with, um, in this, hopefully we're doing the same, doing whatever he tells us to do. And I think, I hope, hopefully part of that is care for people who have mental illness. And also the other thing, other piece, we do educate young people about mental health. It's so important in Cambodia that we have mental health education. So we have a whole piece there, Marilyn, that I haven't even talked about in this program. But um, so there's Candace Promise. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Again, both you and uh, Hang have transformed life. So can we hear a little bit more from Hang? Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I could um, share a little bit. Um, my work with the uh, 
missionary of charity have been very much from baby, you know, like have been um, maybe abandoned uh, at birth uh, up to elderly, you know. So if someone in their whatever stages of life that they have been, um, you know, encounter difficulties, uh, whether it's illness or, um, you know, it could be a, a disability. Uh, Sometimes it could be uh, physically challenges or um, mentally, uh, but they they have a, um, a a refuge, you know, a place that um, at least they can be cared for and then given opportunity to develop, you know. And so some of the thing that we do with the um, differently able folks are uh, we have a routine. Of in the morning we have physical exercise, uh, and then the, the 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 children, the youth, and even the elderly uh, get to exercise. You know, walking, dancing around the yard, and then um, we also have art and craft. So I would draw some uh, picture. You know, like a cow or a lotus uh, flowers or anything, and then sometimes they would like, oh, I would like a pig or I would like a butterfly. You know, they would say what they like. And then I would draw for them and then they would color it. Um, and then the other um, time we would do um, garden, community garden. So basically we would come and have a little piece of land and we just, um, you know, try to work that and using the leaves and using the, uh, you know, um, natural organic way to fertilize it. Um, and then they get to touch the earth and get to see how the tilting, the weeding, the watering, you know, they enjoy it a lot. Uh, and then in time come that we would grow uh, green beans or bok choy or, you know, various kind of, of veggie. And then we were able to have them actually harvest, you know, uh, and then uh, uh, it was such a joy, you know. Uh, to be able to see from the beginning to the end and then actually being able to cook that, you know, for lunch. Um, and so they, they enjoy that a lot. And then we, we would have um, uh, monthly birthdays, you know. So anyone who has birthday in the same month, we would create an opportunity to, uh, um, to work together, to cook, to make food and then enjoy. Um, but one thing I do want to mention about during the COVID time, um, it was very challenging, not only for the, um, you know, resident inside this uh, house uh, called Hope or Hope, but also the villagers, you know, living on the surrounding area uh, because they, they're basically day laborers and they um, earn daily wages and being able to feed their family. But because of COVID, the whole country was pretty much locked down and there was no, um, you know, no work, no going out and selling and buying and all that. And so they were in a very difficult situation. So what we do is we also uh, pack a little bag of rice and noodles and fish sauce and soy sauce and beans and, you know, those kind of thing uh, to provide, you know, to the people in the in the villages, um, at the same time, you know, to help them out. Uh, so, in, in addition to uh, being differently able, there are also the poor that encounter all kind of difficulties that uh, sometimes they don't know how to, um, you know, get through it. So I, I think that the work like with uh, Father Kevin and the work of lay missioner, you know, we come in, we, we just kind of giving a little bit of uh, additional assistance, you know, help uh, to get people through a hard time and then they could get on their feet. The other thing that we also do is um, we support um, kids that have the aptitude, you know, for schooling. Uh, so if they can go to, uh, you know, elementary school, we support them and they have to have good grades <laughs> and uh, their parents have to let them go to school. And then if they can go on, you know, to secondary and, you know, um, high school and this and that, and some kids even go to college, you know, and, and study accountants or, um, um, social work and something like that. Uh, so, so it's a wide spectrum of things 
uh, that can uh, be of assistance, you know, to, to give people a little bit of a, a lift uh, so that they can actually uh, get on their feet and then have a future, you know. So, uh, so that's, that's a little bit of what we do. Well, seeing you and Kevin talk about this, you can see that there's such joy in your ministry. And that I know that you are doing the work of our Lord and that Mary is guiding you and you are giving us Cana's promise. And uh, again, the main focus is to help people in their communities. And I can see the work that you and Father Kevin have done. And uh, we admire you and we hope to be able to give you assistance. Yes. Marilyn, that, that photo on the right, that's our lady the Mekong. That's one of our statues, okay? Right there, that you yes. see her, okay? That's how it, That's the one, one of the statues drawn out of the Mekong River, okay? So, and that's Ambassador Todd that was right there when, um, when uh, she was drawn out, like within a couple of weeks. So, so we, um, uh, so that's not ancient history, Marilyn. That's that's like happened in these last uh, twelve years, you know. So it's a. Uh, um, it's kind of amazing, you know. Um, yeah, so, and, and our program, unlike, you know, really is not just to give medications for mental illness. It is to get people so that they function again. So we have what we call a livelihood recovery program where we give $200 grants uh, for, for them to start a little business. And, and so, first of all, we help with medications, $20 a month, and then transportation, because they come from very far out, back and forth is $25 a month, because they have to bring a, a caregiver with them. So let's say 50 for one patient. We have 200 patients that are sick like this. So that's about $30,000 a year just for that, and uh, for medications. But then in addition, we have this other piece that tries to say, okay, now you're stable. Now let's start to function in the community again. So you showed the cows and things like that. So we help them with one cow, it gets them back in the community that we were um, uh, you know, helping them to, uh, uh, you know, to be part of because our people were left out of the community and left out of their families. Now they're a bread, breadwinner again. Well, thank you, Kevin. Well, let me go in the wrong way here. Uh, I believe the two of you are doing our Lord's work and you have the prayers and hopefully it's some financial support from Americans like the ladies of the ancient order of Hibernians. And I believe because of the work that you've done and also that Hang has done, that we are receiving modern day miracles due to the ministry, missionary work that you've done. And again, remember faithful giving changes lives locally and around the world. And that's what we are meant to do as, as Christians and in particular Catholics. This is our mission to help others. So our next slide will give um, some detailed information about how you can donate to help Father Kevin in his ministry. And I'd like to thank both Father Kevin and Nang uh, for being on this. I also like to thank our Vice President, Marianne Lebinsky, and our um, guru with all of our web webinars, uh, Brianna Curran, for allowing us to have this presentation tonight. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Marilyn. Thank and you. Uh, I'd like to give you a blessing, okay, in Khmer, okay? Som pre chimicha pro team pre po dawi pre niem pre beta pre putran pre vidin dawi sat amen. Which means may the Lord bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen.